code. And then we'll do a highlight me so you can see what I'm doing. There we go. So the first fly that I'm going to, that I'm going to tie is, is called the evil weevil. And it's basically a modified print nymph uh, invented by a fellow by the name of Jeremy Davis out of Calgary. And this was probably my most effective grayling fly, uh, but it's good for whitefish. It's uh, good for trout. Uh, it sinks, it's got a little flash on it. Uh, so to start with, I'll give you the run through on materials. So, you sure it wasn't invented by uh, evil, evil weevil? No, it was He's a relative of evil can evil. Yeah, now, uh, Jim, well, some people don't like Jeremy a whole lot. He's not the most, hasn't, hasn't got the most friendly personality in the world. So maybe we could call it, maybe that's why he called it the evil evil. <laughs> anyway, the hook is a, uh, this one, I'm tying it on a number 10, uh, Hannock, uh, still water and wet. So it's a standard, uh, it's, it's a little longer shank than a standard wet fly hook. I've also tied one on a 12. And 14s are doable. You have to shrink the bead a fair bit. 16s would be a, 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 a sort of a stretch. Um, the bead is 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 a for for this high hook is a, a three millimeter, three and a half millimeter bead. Um, you can use standard. That that's a, a a slotted one. But I've also got this box full of beads here, so you use this brass one or the, the gold ones. And some of them I tie with a, a black head out of, the, out of this box. Uh, black head ones work just as well as the gold head ones. It's just to get the fly down. Um, then uh, the, the first thing I do with these is I, I tie them generally with a red butt. So I'm going to take some red dot thread and I'm going to start it right just behind the hook point. And I'm gonna wrap, start it up, get the thread attached. I'm gonna wrap this red thread all the way down to the, around the bend. So I end up with a, a red tail end here. So once I get around the bend, I'm gonna make sure I get nice tight wraps all the way down and then I'm going to wrap back up and I'm going to stop where on most hooks there would be a barb but on this one it's a barbless hook so about where the barb would normally be then the next thing I'm going to tie in is a little bit of wire uh, for a rib and this one is, is a fine brass wire. You could use a, uh, a gold wire as well. Uh, I like the brass, it's got a, a little reddish glint to it. So, at, but before I do that, I'm gonna uh, use my whip finish and tie off the red thread. So I don't need that anymore. Put my red bobbin away. When we're all done here, I'll give you a quickie tour of my tying venue, which is uh, in what we euphemistically call the dog house here. Uh, so start in with my olive thread right behind the bead and I'm just going to do a little ball of thread right behind the bead to make that bead stay up the front. Now take my nice fine copper wire and I'm going to start it right back behind the bead there. 
And I'm gonna wrap it down the shank with thread till I get to where the barb would normally be. That's going to do be the rib for my thigh. And the next thing that's the tail. And the tail is pretty straightforward. It's a uh, pheasant tail, strands of, strands of pheasant tail. I'm gonna take uh, oh, eight strands, a few strands anyway, pull them off the pheasant tail and measure them out so that the tail sticks past the bend about the same as the gap. I don't want too long a tail on this guy. So I'm tie that in right over the barb where the barb was. And that's a little long, so I'm just going to sneak it forward a bit. And then I'm wrapping that right up to behind the bead before I trim it off. It, it helps build up a little bulk to the body of the fly. Those. And then I need the shell back. And the shell back is this stuff. It's uh, saltwater flashaboo, which has sort of a pearlescent color. And it's reasonable, reasonably wide for flashaboo. It, it's a little wider than the normal flashaboo. With my thread back, sort of two thirds of the way back, I'm going to capture that. Flashaboo on the hook and make sure that when I'm finished tying it on, it's sitting right smack on top of the hook. And I'm going to wrap it right back down to where the wire is there. I got a little bit of flashaboo right here to trim off. Okay. Now, from here, most of what we're going to do is dubbing. And I have the original one, uh, Jeremy used the stuff uh, called Arizona Synthetic Peacock. And he did that for the abdomen of the fly. And then he used a darker version of the same product for the front of the fly. Um, I've tied a lot of these using this, uh, the great Canadian dubbing company stuff. They have two peacock colors, just a natural peacock and then a peacock black, it's quite dark. Uh, now, Jeremy would have used the Arizona peacock in the light color at the back and the dark, or even just uh, a peacock curl for the, for the thorax. But anyway, I'm gonna use the Arizona dubbing for the back just to show you what it looks like. It's a fairly, fairly uh, finely chopped, but it still has, it has some mixed in synthetic stuff. And, I'm just going to twist it onto the thread. And I'm going to try and keep it fairly skinny thread because I want to be able to control the thickness of the abdomen. So if I make it really fat, then I have trouble controlling the taper of the abdomen. I'd kind of like to have the abdomen start at the back. Uh, skinnier than as I go up the, the shank of the hook. So, and, and this stuff is fairly fine dubbing, so you can make it, uh, make it quite, you can see quite, uh, quite tight. Slide it up the thread. That's a trick if you use some of these dubbings, it, you just, you don't work too close to the fly and then you just tie it, slide it up the thread as you uh, need to apply it. So start with a fairly skinny back. And then as I go forward, I will gradually increase the thickness of the abdomen by making more than one wrap. Add a little more. And this can be a little thicker. Some guys are really good at doing this. They can just whip these things out like crazy, but I like to take a little time with the, with the dubbing.
Now, when I get, that's a little too thick. That's the nice thing about this dubbing. It, it, it's actually fairly easy to work with. You can stretch it along the thread and make it make the thread quite thin and then control how much dubbing goes on. And I just, what I need to do now is get up to where the thorax would normally go. And the thorax would be a little like a bead width behind the bead is where the thorax is gonna be. And it's not gonna to be too, too much further back than that. That didn't work. Try again. Again, I'm working with a fairly small amount of dubbing on the thread so that I have control over how this dubbing goes on. Make it nice and thin here so that I can control the thickness. There we go. So now I'm about, about a bead width behind the bead. Now at this point, I'm going to take the saltwater flashaboo and I'm going to pull it forward directly over top of the hook. And I'm going to tie it down right there in front of the abdomen. Two or three wraps with the thread. Then pull it back and wrap over top of it so that it, it's held out of the way. Now I rib this I make sure that this stuff, this saltwater flash is sitting on top of the, the hook, on top of the body. And I'm gonna take my wire and I'm gonna make three or four segmented wraps over top of that flash boot. This is a sh relatively short hook, so that'll be three. And I gotta keep this. I didn't cut it off, you'll see I, I kept the flash boot on. I want the wraps behind that until I get to where I wanna tie on the thorax. And I'm gonna do two or three wraps right in there, just to add a little weight and make sure that wire is gonna stay there. And hold this up and put a three wraps behind, three wraps in front, and then I can probably helicopter that wire out of there. Sometimes these don't want a helicopter out. Yeah, there you go. Now I change dubbing. I'm not gonna use this Peacock black, which is a, it's it's sort of a peacock color, but it's quite dark. I'll be able to see what I mean. And it this this dubbing you the other stuff that I've seen used is is uh, crystal dubbing, but this diamond dub has got lots of uh, shiny fibers in it. It works it works in a number of different colors. I have a whole collection of colors in that. And again, I'm going to make this uh, a fairly tight little dubbing rope. And I'm going to wrap a thorax in here. And the thorax is going to be roughly double the thickness of, of the abdomen. It's going to be fairly chunky. A little more here. There we go. So you can see it's 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 nice and chunky there. Then I'm gonna bring the flashaboo forward over top of that and tie the flashaboo off right behind the bead. Once again, pull it back, lock it in. I'll turn the flashaboo out. And the final bit of stuff here is wherever they go is goose bias. Like we do with a with a prince nymph. I'm gonna find, pull out a couple of goose bias off the stem. There's do one. Come on over there. 
pull two off here. One, two. Pull right off the stem. Now I take them and they're, they're curved. You can see there's a curvature to them. And I'm gonna curve them so they, they curve down. And I'm gonna make them right back to the end of the abdomen. I'm gonna measure them out, hold them at a 45, hold it at a 45 degree right on top of where the bead is and hold it with my thumb and then do a couple of wraps right behind the bead. And you see it, when you do that, they stick up and they stick up at, a, at an angle off to the side, the first one. And then the second one, I'm gonna do the same thing with curving down, measure it the same length as the other, as near as I can get, and lay that down on the, the hook at that 45 degree angle again, and cinch it down with a couple of good wraps. And oops, I got an extra in there somehow. How did that happen? <laughs> Must have pulled two, two off at once. All right. There we go. They got two biots together. I don't want to. There we go. Again, measure that so that it's right the right length, a 45 degree angle, and bang. So once again, you can see they're they're separated on either side at a nice angle. I'm gonna wrap in front of those and trim them off. Last thing I'm gonna do is take just a teeny bit of this black dubbing and make just a, a really tight little rope right there. And I'm gonna wrap that on right over top of the butts of the biots. And then get my whip finisher. And tie off right, right behind the bead. Come on, get on there. There you go. There's my evil weevil. Mm -hmm. And if you want, you can you can take your uh, your roughing up tool and and do a little bit of pull a few bits out on the bottom from the thorax to make legs. Just make them a little fuzzier. And that's it. You so say you can tie those down to probably. 16s would I wouldn't go any smaller than 16s, uh, but of course you have to change the bead size, and you're probably going to want to use a 2x long hook for that so that you have enough to get that segmentation between the the abdomen and the thorax. So there we go. Didn't very take nice. long. Very nice, Dave. And 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 it's a very effective fly fish under a strike indicator uh, on flowing waters. Uh, under, you, can, you can fish them in still waters as well. What this represents is a, uh, a crawler style mayfly nymph. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you have read Dave Hughes book on, uh, on nymphs. Uh, the, the, may, the mayfly nymphs come in three different types. There's the swimmers, the crawlers, and the burrowers. And the, the swimmers have a, a much longer thorax. So you'd want to tie those on a, a, at least a three X long hook. Uh, the crawlers are a little fatter. They, they tend to hang on to the rocks there on the bottom. And the swimmers you'll find in slower water in pools, the crawlers you'll find in, in faster water, uh, except when they, they do a thing called behavioral drift where they will distribute themselves throughout the stream by letting go of the rocks and let the current carry them down. So these guys will, will float down the stream uh, 
spots. So you don't necessarily have to fish them right smack on the bottom. Uh, and the burrowers, the, we never fish for them because they're always down in the mud. Uh, so you're basically fishing either the swimmers or the crawlers. Uh, and that gave the swimmers, usually it's in slower water because they do swim around a bit. So typical may, mayfly nymph. Hare's ears uh, and, and, and these guys and prince nymphs are, are the patterns you typically use for fishing for those mayfly nymphs. And uh, pick the uh, size of fly based on what you see flying around for mayflies. So there you go. I'll take myself off of spotlight here. And we're back, I think. Thank you, Dave. Very nice fly. Yeah. I'm I got ten, I, tons of these. I, I pack a lot of them because if I'm going to go fishing uh, streams, I have an entire box of mayfly style nymphs, different colors and sizes. So you mostly fish this in, in size 14 by the sound of it. Yeah, I think 14s, uh, 10s, 12s. Uh, this is this is a 10. Again, a short shank hook. Uh, and, and there are some big mayflies, like depending on the time of year, right? Yeah. Later on in the summer, later on in the year, they tend to be bigger. The spring, they'll be tiny. Well, the general rule is you, uh, the, the sizes keep changing all year long because it's pre-emergence. You're going to have the biggest nymphs. Yeah. Right. Just before they yep. merge, yep. and after they lay eggs, you're gonna have the smallest ones. That's right. Yeah. Right. And so in the fall, tip. So your typical mayfly that uh, let's say merges sometime in the spring and summer, leading up to emergence, you're gonna have big, bigger nymphs. Yep. And in the fall, you know, and that applies to the ones with a single generation. Right. So multiple generations or nymphs that take more than a year between emergent, you know, yeah. the larval stage and emergence, then it's a different ball game too, you know, yeah. with the, yeah. like stoneflies are the typical example. Yeah, which reminds me, of, that's what I'm going to, I think I'm going to do uh, this month for Hague Brown is I'm going to do a golden stone. Right. Anyway, the, the, the other trick is, you know, this, this type of flies, you go down in size, you start dropping bits. Right. So, yes, um, on, yeah, on a size 16, you know, for sport, you may be tinkering with bias, but at some point you say, you know what, you I, say to hell with the bias. I can probably do this without a bias and replace it with something else. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you go small enough, I think you're pretty safe to drop the tails as well. If you don't want to mess with those, you know, typically tails are not that difficult. But yeah. anything that's like feels like it's a little bit too much work, you can safely drop. Other than the shellback, you can do. I'm pretty confident this works down to size 20, no problem. Yeah, yeah. you might want not want to use the saltwater flashaboo because it's quite wide. No, what you do is you use the the other flashaboo that's narrower, and you take narrower. a couple of strands of it. Yeah, and it works beautifully. Yeah, it's, it's a skinnier product. It's more like a string, and you just use more than one strand. Yeah, you get two. If you go small enough, two two strands is plenty. Yeah, I've yeah, and and and, <coughs> and you can do these with like a saltwater uh, flashaboo as the flashback on a on a pheasant tail. Yeah, it's just uh, just where the abdomen the, the, is all just wrapped pheasant tail. Tie them on at the tail and wrap them around. Yeah. And then, next uh, next week I'm gonna do one with a different uh, a different nymph. Yeah. Uh, where I use where I use that exact exact thing, so it's gonna look a lot. That my next two flies are gonna look a lot like a very much simplified version of of, of this evil weevil. Yeah. So you know, drop a bunch of things and you get a simpler fly that you can tie uh, ties tie in a smaller size. Yeah. But I have to do some um, technical stuff first. Okay. All right. So I'm, I'm going to, to turn to the technical stuff. So I uh, I promised I was gonna I was gonna go through my little collection of vices, and uh, was uh, 
thinking a little bit about the ways we justify these things, you know. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, do you need a second vice? Nah, you don't, obviously. But uh, do you need that second rod? <laughs> you know. So anyway, a fancy vice will set you back as much as a mid-range rod these days. Yeah. And Warm. if you're really into fly tying, um, they can be beautiful pieces of machinery that you can fondle while you're tying flies. So that's a lot of fun just uh, having, you know, playing with a vice. Well, so anyway, this is the... Uh, yes, so were, were, were you, did you attend the session when Mike, Mark, Mark Pettijon was in Edmonton? No, no, I, w I okay. wasn't, I wasn't there. So I, so I just got, got intrigued by the vice, uh, yeah. by the fact that this is, this is a very portable uh, model. It, it really is built like a Swiss army knife. Um, yeah. And it's got the, um, I'm going to try to, uh, so it's got the, the clamp vise, but this clamp vise can be rearranged into a tabletop pedestal through judicious unscrewing and screwing of parts. So it's, it's, it's quite clever. And I was, you know, kind of curious about this whole idea of, of rotary tying. Okay. As you can see, this is a traditional rotary vise unlike the uh, unlike the Norvice that I was showing um, last time. But anyway, so what I did here is I took the I took the Petit Jean vice and then I took uh, an old very simple wire bobbin holder that I mounted on another stem and I set up a stationary uh, bobbin rest very similar setup to the way the Norovice um, is meant to be used. And that's, again, I'm using the, the retractable bobbin, which is very convenient for rotary tying. Anyway, so the reason I brought up the, uh, the rotary vise was that I was going to play a little bit with these bobbin holders and demonstrate a little bit the main situations i'm gonna refocus here on the on the hook okay the uh this vice has a nice little pin here you can you can just easily plug in to check the alignment of, of your hook this is one thing that the norvice i think used to have in the old days and the newer vices no longer have it can be handy at, at least initially until you get a feel for how to put this hook in the vise so the shank of the hook is as close to as possible in line with the axis of rotation okay anyway so the the, the main materials that we typically um that i typically like to use with uh, a spool keeper are weighting wire so like lead wire Ribbing wire, floss, and tinsel. Okay. And the easiest to to see how I play with this is on the on the rotary vise. So attach some thread. And the way I like to do the wire is like this. So if you want to do it by hand, so let's say this is kind of standard tying, if you will. Okay. So what I do, if you put a thread base, it usually holds the wire a little bit better in place. So what I do is I need to switch hands. Sorry. I take my uh, the same pliers that I used to crimp the barbs on the hooks and grab one end of the wire and start wrapping the wire on the hook. Okay. At some point, you know, you can let go 
the the end where you held it with the pliers kind of is very short so it's easy to fold back on the hook if you put a thread base this isn't going to go anywhere typically it just needs a little bit of finger pressure to stay put and here you can pinch it with your fingernail and you've left enough room for the head of the fly and then of course you to be on the safe side you secure this with some thread you build a little you build a little ramp here to get a smooth body right close to the the point where the you started the lead just taper it off a little bit and then you're ready to do whatever whatever happens to come next okay so that's one one thing and there's no waste you're not throwing away any lead in the environment with this it's all nice and tidy let's take a look at your typical tinsel body ribbing situation there again I'm gonna start with the thread And as usual, the rib is the first thing that goes on. Now, because you want a smooth body, you want to make sure that you start your wire at the front of the hook and you go with even wraps. Whoops. This is where a Dyna King is not going to do tricks like that on you. Once it's grabbed the hook here, I, I have to yet learn the correct tensioning. Okay, now the problem with ribbing materials and stuff is you need to have a way of holding the bobbin so it rotates with the vise if you're going to do rotary tying. So that's always a little bit of a challenge. Okay. So what I did is I just took... Ah, this is not right I'm going to tighten this up I wish this little knob things knob thing was on my side of the hook not on the other side of the hook on the other side of the jaws it's, that's an inconvenient I guess you're expected to do it with your right hand and then you take your tinsel so let's say I want I want silver up, so I tie it with the gold side up. And then let this hang, pull off a little bit of thread and do a little knot. Okay, so now I wanna I wanna go rotary with this. So put my thread out of the way and then start wrapping the tinsel and now the trick with this is i want to go in even turns as smoothly as possible i don't need to worry too much about the overlapping And here, when I get to the bend, I just have to do a bit of jigging around. And then I bring it back. And the advantage of the spool keeper here is pretty obvious. What it does is it just helps you hold on to this and feeds the, the tinsel to you in a very kind of smooth and consistent manner. So you can actually concentrate on the business of getting that body. So Florin, you adapted that other spool that's on your vise. You hooked that up somehow, right? Yes, I'll 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 explain that in a in a second. Okay, so once I'm done with the tinsel, I just secure this nicely at the end. And at this point I 
I could again put the thread away, but it's it's really unnecessary, I find. I, I just begin wrapping. So what I can do to be on the safer side here, I just let some thread out. And then I just take my wire and do my wraps. Bring it up to the front. And whoops. And one of the tricks with with tinsel is to go if you have trouble getting a nice smooth body is to just go a size smaller. That's what I find uh, is what works well. All right, so what I did here, for those of you who have rotary vices and would like to experiment with this, maybe you'll find a better, a better solution than, than, than mine. So what I did is I took some, some shrink tubing and mm -hmm. one of these fairly tiny, strong magnets. And I just put several layers of shrink tubing on top. And here it just, you can sort of see the magnet is still just visible a little bit in the center. Okay. So what that does is if your jaws are steel as they ought to be, and not some weird stainless, this thing is going to stick on most parts of your of your vice, right? And then I tried to make this portion of it. So this is just shrink tubing, nothing fancy there. I just tried to make that so that it fits inside a bobbin spool, right? And fits a little tight, right? So here is just a little thicker. So when you when you push in this thing, you know, it's just a light pressure fit. And then you just put this somewhere on your vise and you're done. Okay. And then when you, when you turn the vise, the happy result is that this turns with it. Okay. I think you can do up to two materials this way on a rotary vise. Beyond that, I think I've tried it with, with two ones, but typically it's only one material that you need to put out of the way while you do wrap the other one so that's that's that okay so that's tinsel and ribbing and then let's see one more hook for the final thing which is floss so again take the take the thread And the floss, now I did two things. The floss, it's in storage already with the, with the spool keeper on it. And then on top of that, to get better control of my floss, I also use a bobbin holder. Okay, depending on the thickness of your floss, you might want to dig in your, in your box of tools for something that has a slightly larger inner diameter. Okay. So this is the uh, this is the TMCO heavy duty whatever um, bobbin holder that has a, a thicker diameter. So for this particular floss, I could have I could have gone to something as thin as uh, as the Norvice bobbin, but that's a little bit at the limit. If you go with embroidery flosses, um, you'll find that those tend to be a little bit thicker, depending on how many strands you use. Um, and so in this case, actually, I don't even need a knot. So here's my floss. And then I can, you know, if you tie non rotary, you can just use this to wrap, and that gives you nicer, nicer control. And if you're doing rotary, you can just angle it and you know your fingers are out of the way you can actually see what you're doing you can also 
easily avoid and I, sh I shouldn't speak out of turn here I should make sure that I've avoided the point of the hook before I say anything not to jinx it right and then this is all there is to it nice and easy you come to the end Two strands have separated, okay, no biggie. Just gather them with a the thread and trim and you're done. Okay. And then you can you could have done this more complicated with a rib and whatever, but that's not absolutely necessary. Okay. So yeah, it's uh, in fact this is the first time I I actually tried uh, the uh, the Tijan vice uh, as a rotary vice. I've tied on it before, but just as a regular vice, this is the first time rotary. And um, what I can say is that having the uh, the automatic retractable bobbin works just as well as on the Nor vice. Okay. And what's beautiful about this one is, and your standard style rotary vice, is that it gives you really good access here to the tail. So if you do small small flies with tails on them. This is a lot more convenient than on the Nor vice. There's another feature to this vice that I haven't used yet, and I'm going to try to use at some point in the not too distant future. And that is, if I disassemble this end, and I have to, so you take this nut off, and then I have, Dave inspired me to procure some tubing. I have a little needle here. And if I turn this baby around, which is going like this, I have a tube tying setup. And uh, that's what I said. This is the Swiss Army of fly tying vices, right? And this is this is part of the fun, um, you know. And ta-da! Here we are. I shouldn't lose critical parts. Anyway, I'm going to uh, try to learn to tie some flies on tubes. And once I've I've done something that doesn't look horrible, um, I'm going to do a little. Uh, a little demonstration of that as well. So this is the uh, the vice part, and now I have to put it all back together because I need to do the actual pattern for the day. Okay. So. Before you before you get there, while you're setting up, let, let me show you a <laughs> Mark yeah, Petty. Yeah, then let me good. stop sharing, okay? Yeah. Okay. So you can uh, you can. Yeah. Um, Mark Pettyjohn visited Edmonton probably about. 15 years ago and he's he's a very innovative fly tire and he he sells some interesting products so i'll i'll do a see if i can do camera switch here okay so here by the way i'm, I'm tying out in the, in the in the doghouse so this is my roll top desk with with drawers full of material and all sorts of stuff. But Mark Perijan sold not only the, the fly tying vices, but this is his kit of, of tools, a couple of scissors, uh, a whip finisher, a, a dubbing twister, and, and a, a few other things. Swiss made, of course, there's a spare bit set of scissors. The other thing he sold was these guys, which are used for uh, making flies that use uh, CDC. And what you do is
you lost Dave. Yeah, I, is anyone having trouble uh, connecting with uh, Dave? Yeah, he, he lost his connection, I think. Oh, okay, yeah, I was wondering what happened. I think he was talking about the instability of Wi-Fi in his doghouse earlier, so that's been a persistent problem, I think. Let's hope he'll be back soon. I don't know if he knows he lost us. Oh, I think now he knows because he completely dropped off. So he's, 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 he's completely gone. So I'm going to, uh, yeah, for some reason, I, for some reason, my internet hung up, which is one of the things I worried about being out here in the doghouse. I moved my I moved my iPad around too much, I think. <laughs> anyway, so so that's what Mark Pettijon. He makes these beautiful equipment and he sells some incredible CDC fibers as well. Based in Switzerland, he is. Okay, you should be back in, in business now. Fine. Yes all back in business here we are so this now is part of a series i'm gonna do maybe a couple of flies uh along these lines so these are relatively small flies and if you tie them on these curved hooks you can make the actual fly um, even smaller so if you were to tie on a standard size you know, for me, for years, a standard nymph hook was a Mastad 9671. But Mastad 9671 only goes down to size 18. And they're fairly long shank. So the length of a fly you would tie kind of using, you know, standard proportions uh, relative to the hook shank, the standard size you tie on a Mastad 9671 size 18 is more like a size 16 or even 14 on one of these little curved hooks okay the other thing is here you get a wider gape you get a big eye these are not hard to tie on your tippet they're heavy wire you don't need to worry about straightening uh, of hooks and reports from the field seem to indicate that yes indeed these are strong sturdy hooks Okay, so no more rotary tying here. This is a very simple fly. I'm just using some 8 aught uni thread in tan because I want it to blend with the golden pheasant that I'm using. And of course, inspired by, by Dave as usual, um, I also have a set of these uh, Petit Jean tools. Uh, which I don't use too much uh, because the um, I find my my favorite hackle pliers uh, tend to be this style, the the Tiemco, and then there's the uh, similar one made by Griffin. And the the whip finisher I just learned to use the Mattarelli and stuck with it forever. So that's that's that. Anyway, so um, this is simple ribbed fly so fine copper wire as fine as you can get away with i like this copper wire to be discreet here and again here you can control how big your nymph is going to be depending on how far back into the into the bend of the hook you're going to go now, one downside of the Swiss vise is it doesn't have any doodad to hang your materials over. And as I keep all my things on spools, I could, I suppose I could just stick it on here with that magnet if I can find it. Because otherwise, if you let things hang down, your, your thread tangles up with your materials and it just a major pain. So 
So this is some really nice fine copper wire I retrieved from some transformer from a piece of electronics that was going to be thrown away. And golden pheasant tail. You can experiment with this also for pheasant tail nymphs. It just gives you a different, different coloration and, and different kind of um, banding on the uh, on the fly. And you don't need an awful lot, you know, four or five fibers. You just kind of adjust to the to the size of the fly. Now the thing with this golden pheasant it's actually a very delicate material so the tips are very easy to break just trim off you know half a centimeter centimeter whatever and take that away and see this is not very convenient here because it goes where your hand is the alternative i found with this vice is to do this put this little pin and just hang I don't know if you can see that on the screen but I'm just hanging the wire over that over that pin so it's out of the way yep it's easily visible okay so some kind of a material you know this is this is one thing it's it's all improvised but I I tied a few flies this way and it works well um this is one of the downsides of this this style of vice. It doesn't give you a good way of hanging materials over and it doesn't give you a very good hand rest here. So that's uh... okay. Now just wrap this around. Standard standard procedure. So use my my hackle pliers. And with this, you can also spin this a little bit to make like a little bit of a rope out of that pheasant tail. And then come all the way right behind the bead because there's always so much space behind the bead that you can afford. You don't have to worry about when you tie with beads, you don't have to worry about leaving that big gap behind the point where you finish the fly because a lot of material gets buried behind the bead okay and then you can take your wire and here you can you can counter wrap if you want you have a choice basically you can counter wrap the wire so in the opposite direction you normally go with the thread and that'll make the wire stick out a little bit more. Or you can bury it in the pheasant tail going the same way you wrapped the pheasant tail. Either way is fine. Okay, a few wraps of thread here to secure that wire properly. You don't want your wire rib to go away. And the final touch is just a little bit of, you can see I've Caught by mistake here, just chunk off my desk. There's maybe a fiber or two of the dubbing material I'm using. There you go. I think I took it all away. So this is um, this diamond dub stuff. Um, I don't think it matters. Anything that's sparkly and makes you happy is is gonna work. Okay. Alternatives are this comes in a in a long fiber version. I think is the exact uh, the exact same thing. And the other way to do this is to just take a, a strand or to, you take a strand of this and you fold it in two and you just put it like a little wing stub right behind the bead. So either way works well. And when you go to small flies and you want shell backs, this would be, for example, one of the things you could use. Okay. So here, you know, you have 
you can experiment with with different things. I like this thing because it has this little uh, kind of bluish fluorescent reflection and just dub it here and like I said it's just a little accent behind the bead and then whip finish it's all safe and sound behind the bead and trim and ta-da we're done that's it and using this idea you can you can do a whole bunch of of things in 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 really small uh really small sizes and you can see here how you get this segmentation effect just from the colors on the golden pheasant it makes very nice looking nymphs okay Good. and that's the fly for today and i'm going to do an equally simple one next time and then time permitting maybe i'll i'll squeeze in two of these uh small flies i've been experimenting so the one i i had in mind for next time uh looks like this and this might be something of more interest to you guys uh, i find that this fly and so here's a bigger one this is a, a size 14 hook um this is really a lot of this is tied a bit like the evil weevil so it's just pink dubbing and at some point i resorted to using two tones of pink dubbing but this is like very uh, very bright fluorescent pink. There is a shell back here that shows in the right light. You can you can see it, and this is that uh, finer fi um, a finer flashaboo in a in the pink version. There's no tail on this, and then the same material I use for the shell back, I left a little stub there as a bit of a like a wing. And this is a 